uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome, and um, you know, I've been given this envious and tough, very tough task of sitting in between two pillars of Indian industry. And here, this poor young, big guy, but <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Nikun Javeri, and uh, I'm an Ascent member. Uh, been in, in with Ascent for the last, I think, five I don't know, five, five, five years plus. Uh, had, having a great journey, and you know, I hope all of you as well are. <coughs> um, I have a software company of my own. Um, we have about 600 people. Uh, been in the business for the last 30 years, and uh, have about over 600. And and we have customers all over the world. Uh, my claim to fame, as I call it, was I was the CIO, the outsourced CIO to PepsiCo for a period of six years. So I had the envious, I had the, the job of. of being a customer and a vendor to Pepsi. So I was giving my own company work, which is a great situation to be in if you can ever get into that. So but that's where it was. Uh, let me introduce uh, briefly Anjali Bansal. Well, the title says, I mean, the, 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 this says it all. The most powerful woman in Indian business. That's what business today, Fortune India have kind of called her. But you know, well, that's a good award to get and a good, uh, but I think what she has behind her is really what, what counts. She's an independent director today at GSK, Bata, Tata Power and Boltas. Uh, is committed to a lot of social enterprise, so she's balancing both. She's an advisor at Seva and Grameen and also on the advisory board of Columbia University's uh, Global Center for Southeast Asia. Uh, and of course, focusing on corporate governance in a big way for, uh, and, and diversity in a very big way. Uh, yeah, I think she, with the Fiki Center, and uh, she's working with, uh, co-founded the, uh, sorry, uh, women, women on the board. On the board. Uh, there's, it, you know, there's so much, I don't know what, what to pick up from the whole thing. Uh, but along with that, she's also, uh, you know, been working with lots of startups. So she's, she's uh, you know, a charter member of Thai. Uh, she's a managing committee of... India Venture Capital Association. Uh, she's mentoring the Saha Fund, the Female Founders Fund, the Facebook She Tech, She Leads Tech Fund. So, you know, she's, I don't know where she finds the time, all over the place, but, uh, and of course, her past is, is, is stellar, you know. Global partner MD at TPG, private equity. Uh, you know, Strat consultant at McKinsey in New York and Mumbai. And then she ran and founded Spencer Stewart in India, and also was on the a global partner on the aspect board. So, again, you have somebody here who is somebody you got to pick on and, and you know pick her brains on. And what do I say about Harshbury? I think we all know him. <laughs> so I'm not going to say much more except we have Harshbury with us. Okay. And uh, with that, I'll kind of get straight into the topic, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of, you know, there was a bunch of questions which I had a chance to get from all of you. Uh, to be precise, I had something like 80 questions. <laughs> we have a limited amount of time. So forgive me if I skip over some of your questions. We will be giving you all time at the end to ask questions and you know ask direct questions to everybody. I'm going to go through a flow which I've created in my head. So please bear with me, okay? Um, thank you. I want you to cut down if those who have not come, you can drop their questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know who they are, Ashbai. <laughs> I, I got a list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with you, Anjali. Uh, you know, what are the things that an entrepreneur should focus on when he or she is thinking of scaling up? So, first of all, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I think I'm here to learn as much as to share, and having an opportunity to hear Harsh talk about scaling and building business, I tell you, is a rare privilege and treat. So I wasn't going to give up on that. And then in addition to uh, be here with all of you, all entrepreneurs, I know I'm going to take more out of the session than I will give. So thank you for having me here. Delighted. And uh, your question was, okay. how should you think, what should you think about when you are scaling when, up? When, when you start thinking about scaling up, what are the things you should be focusing on? What are the first? Mm. First few macro level things we should be worried about, etc. So in my mind, when you think about an enterprise, you know, an enterprise is a house, it's a structure. Mm -hmm. And to build a big building, you need a deep foundation. 
So depending on what your ambition and scale of ambition is, I think that your foundation has to be as big, as deep, as broad, and more robust. And so, so there are some things that are foundational in any enterprise. And this is not about a startup or scaling up or Pepsi or Unilever or Marico. It's for all enterprises. Particularly when you are an entrepreneur, you are working in a resource-constrained environment. So it becomes even more important to have a very sharp view on the following things, in my view. Um, one is strategy. And strategy is not sort of big McKinsey, BCG strategy. It is very practical, fundamental. What is my product? What is my service? Who's my customer? What's my product market fit? Who's going to buy it? Who's going to pay for it? So what, where's revenue going to come from? How will it be profitable? How do I sell? How do I go to market? So that all of that is strategy. I think it's very important to be clear on business model, business strategy, in a very practical way. The second thing is, for scaling up, you need a lot of scalable <coughs> systems and processes. Often in the startup world particularly, you know, people think about process as a bad thing. Oh, you know, process, it's meant for the G's and so on. You know, it's bureaucracy, <coughs> it slows you down. It may slow you down temporarily, but you need to have processes that are robust for you to scale. And these are, again, very fundamental processes, so finance and accounts, so f &A. Uh, HR and HR again is around uh, you know, culture and so on, yes, but again, extremely nuts and bolts, practical performance management systems, incentive systems, hiring, recruitment, and so on. IT, are you, do you have a system that captures good data, good robust data, gives you the MIS, gives you the tools for good decision making? Uh, you may or may not have ERP implemented, but even without ERP, and you know, Nikon do better than you to talk about <laughs> IT systems, but you know, even without that, you need to have the right technology and the right information systems. And uh, marketing and branding. So if you're in anything that has to do with consumer, uh, having a strong marketing muscle. So strategy is one pillar. Scalable systems and processes, second pillar. Third pillar is people. If you have the right organization structure, um, you may not have all your boxes populated, but at least know what the functions are. Do you have the right people? Are you able to get the best people possible that you can either afford or attract at that scale? So people. And finally, financing. Very important to think about financing. And I say financing versus funding, because at the scale up phase, depending on the nature of your business, it may be equity, it may not be equity. It may just be working capital. So are you thinking about financing as a strategic pillar while scaling up? So I'll pause that. Okay. Um, I think you know, taking that forward is a great segue to the next step. You know, a bunch of questions I've got on, you know, before you even say, we have all this thought about, right? We have multiple things which Anjali mentioned. Rajpal, a question which, you know, entrepreneurs like me, may, where we often ask is, you know, I'm 55, should I scale up? <laughs> so I think a question which a lot of, uh, what I'm getting from a lot of people is, when is the right time to scale? Should I scale? What are the things you should keep in mind before you make that decision? Yeah, it's time to you know go out and, and, and scale. Yeah, that's there are two sets of issues. One is your personal personal desire to grow. You have suggested a certain age, <laughs> which to me doesn't make any sense. So it is nothing related to age. It is that burning desire to succeed. Um, which will lead to scale up. So if you don't have the desire to succeed and if you're 55 and if you say that, okay, I'm going to take life easy, then it's better not to scale up. But if you don't scale up, then you're falling behind. So then you have to start asking the question is, are you, do you want to be in business? Uh, so you have two options. One is to recruit a CEO or one of your family members if that person is ready to hand over the charge. Other is to sell the business or close it down. So I think that decision, and it's an important age you were in, whether it's 50, 55, 60, I think there is a certain change in one's thinking and uh, you've done that business development for a long period of time and you want to reinvent yourself, and want to do new things. So it's perfectly okay to, to raise those questions, do I want to be in business? And that's very natural, I would say. Uh, a lot will depend on the at 55, suppose if you started at 40, 45 and you still have a desire to grow, there is nothing wrong in, in 
she's scaling up at 55, why 55? People have started business. I think Captain Nair of Leela started business at 65 or 70 in the, the Leela hotel. So there's nothing wrong. And I don't think it's related to age, but it's related to personal mindset. What do I want to do at that particular stage in my life? And I've seen many uh, recently, recent past, many individuals who have given thriving practice or somebody like Ashish Dawa, you know, he's left everything and into full time into charity. But that's his mindset and that's what he wanted to do. So I would say that there is a right answer. Uh, I think a lot will depend on the individual. But it's better to go on thinking about it and say, what do I want to do in life? You know? I think the second question you raised was, when should an organization scale up? Right. So that's a completely different related more to the business part of it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot depends on to what extent, where have you arrived. So in your first phase of startup or uh, post startup, do you have the necessary building blocks in terms of the business? Uh, are you seeing traction in terms of growth? Are you seeing your opportunities? Do you see business opportunities in, in whatever you're doing or related to what you're doing? So I think if you're struggling, uh, in terms of existing business, either in terms of execution or processes or things are not going as per your original plan, then you can't s start thinking of scaling up because you know, if your fundamentals are weak and if your building blocks are very, very weak, then if you start scaling up, then you know it will again hit you more because you are doing it to a larger scale. So I would say that the business has to come to a certain, I would say break even or making profitability, but a certain stability in terms of ability to handle growth and uh, at that time I think one should start scaling but I think growth is very important you can't say I will not grow so I think in mind you have to say you have to grow and for me to grow I need to necessarily building blocks let me get over it and then start growing if, if you have a mindset of not growing then you are actually falling behind and then it's actually you are losing your competitiveness in the marketplace compared to many other competitors or you may just fall behind and then it leads to demotivation within the organization. Because if the promoter is giving signals that he doesn't want to grow, and the existing people who are in the organization, they will leave. Because most of your talent will need a certain challenge. And if they don't see that challenge coming, a challenge, a desirable future in terms of whatever, financial, otherwise, in terms of status, if they don't see that the entrepreneur is driven within, they will all leave. So the business will go down you live if the mindset is not to grow. So the mindset has always to be to grow provided you have the necessary building block and you see opportunities in future to grow. Growth, scaling, if you want to continue organizations, right? But you know, there is a question which somebody asked and said, you know, the markets are uncertain today. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty floating around in the marketplace, GST, demonetization, you know, the world is going going nuts. Yes. So, with that in mind, uh, from a timing point of view, is it worth investing today in scaling? Should we start thinking about, or should we say, you know what, let me keep my own business running for a while, let the global ecosystem settle down, and then move forward? What do you think, Ajit? So, I, I was reflecting on that question actually, and I'm not sure there is one answer to it. It is so very dependent on what is the nature of business, mm -hmm. uh, what is your risk appetite. Because for each of these situations that presents a, a, a threat, if you will, or a problem, mm -hmm. equally it is an opportunity. So the biggest returns tend to come in times of chaos and uncertainty. So there is, and so that goes to what's your fiber as an entrepreneur. And there's no judgment around it, by the way. There's nothing to say that it, you are, you are, it's better to be a risk taker versus not to be a risk taker. You have to apply, I think, some introspection. Who are you? Where, where is your business? Do you have the resources? Let's say you take a big risk, you take a big bet in a time of uncertainty. Do you have the resources to see you through? Because you're likely to have more volatility. You're likely your business will go through ups and downs. If you know, if you're facing, if you're in an industry that has uh, some regulatory risk, you could get severely disrupted, not by market forces, but by regulatory risk. So, do you have the resources to see you through? Let's say you're an export business and suddenly GST strikes, right? And GST is very good for the country, it's very good for the economy, but in the short term, it's going to extend your working capital cycle. 100 days. 
Do you have the resources to see you through that? So is that the time you should be growing or saying, okay, let me consolidate, let me just focus? Got it. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, when there's a lot of movement, <laughs> disruption. <are you> <laughs> when there's a lot of movement, are you watching your core asset? <laughs> 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 well said, well said. <laughs> so I think there's no right answer. At the same time, when there is disruption and all sorts of things going on, whether it's in the world or it's in India and so on, you could be the sort of entrepreneur that says, gosh, I just raised equity. I have money. I have money in the bank. I'm going to take uh, your core business. You have the appetite, resources, and internal, um, I would say, sort of strength to see you through if there is volatility. I don't know if there is a right or wrong time, okay. per se. No, and I think you know you, you brought up a great point about the point about you know there may be you may blow up people's money and you have, all your stakeholders need to be uh, kind of consensus. you know consensus. And you know that's an actually an interesting uh, question. And Harshpa, I think you dealt with this before, and you know sort of love to get your perspective. Is there are different stakeholders in any business, and have they have different aspirations? You, as the founder or the promoter, wants to scale, but there are a bunch of other guys, <coughs> investors, a bunch of people who don't have that desire to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you kind of balance those multiple pulling forces and yet plow the path of, of scale? You have you've done this yeah. before, so I'd love to get your story, your perspective. So I think the one is you may have conflicts. First of all, you, as the head of the business, may have conflict with your own team. Mm -hmm. You may have conflict with your board of directors, you may have conflict with your, if you have a PE person, then PE person, if you are a public company, then you may have conflict with some of the analysts and your investors. So you are right that uh, such conflicts will occur. Mm -hmm. And your key task is then to <coughs> see whether whatever you suggest is it good for the business. And that's, and you need to have dialogue. You cannot say I will do it and forget about it. And I think it's very important that you have a dialogue with each stakeholder, especially if it's a large kind of investment or a big bet you are taking which will impact them. Uh, and I think you need to, ideally speaking, if you get a consensus, that's the best option. Uh, if the dialogue itself will help you improve your uh, proposition, will expose you to the risk, you, have one, you may have some blind spots. <coughs> so I think it's very important to have a dialogue with all the stakeholders. First, initially internally, I would say, with the team. And once um, that's crystallized, then ideally speaking with the board of directors in that in that uh, order, um, and then with the external investors. Uh, sometimes, in spite of doing all that, some other stakeholder may say no, I don't agree. And at that time, you need to take a call with the word still. Um, take that risk uh, because. Ultimately, I think it is your call. And sometimes, um, trying to get consensus, you don't want to have too much of a compromise decision. So, if you have the courage of your conviction, then sometimes you may say that, okay, I am taking this call in spite of what I heard from you. And um, just tell me this could be the implication, negative implication, but <coughs> there could be opportunities also. So, I think the ultimate call would be, could be the head of the business cannot get into too much of compromises. I am not saying that you don't dialogue. You must dialogue. You must try and arrive at a consensus. You must fill in all the blind spots. But still at the end of it, if you think that you have, if you are on the right track because you have that inner, you may call it gut feel or you may have conviction or you feel that it's very important to do that. Especially if your team is backing you, I would take that. If the team is not backing you, then I would start getting worried because I cannot be a lone person where my team is not backing me, the board is not backing me and the external investor. But if I have the backing of my team, I would I would try and take, even if some external investor is saying no, I will try and convince them first. Uh, if that is not the case, I will try and try and take this. If it anything to do with governance, I would not touch it. Anything to do with governance in terms of breaking some rules, then the idea is out of question. But if it is a business, purely a business decision, then 
depending on what is the issue I may I may decide to go ahead in spite of the opposition. If I am a team back, I don't know what other team is, but it is. I feel quite actually similarly, yeah, and yeah. Uh, your team works with you is because they trust you and your judgment. So somewhere, you know, we all, I think many of us, I know I am, for example, very data driven, very analytical, but the worst decisions I have made ever are when I ignored my instincts. So I think that there's a role that instincts and judgment play, and that's what makes you an entrepreneur. So you have to trust that. And uh, I completely concur, if your team is with you, then the work has to be done to get your stakeholders aligned. And by the stakeholders are not there as blockers. And they are also trusting you and backing you and so on. And sometimes they bring up questions and issues that you might not have thought about. So this very constructive, positive, spirited dialogue is a very useful thing to do. I think anything that takes governance risk is highly I, I, I think. I know for sure I wouldn't have the courage to do that and I don't want to have the courage to do that. So, so if you take governance as hygiene as required, then it's a matter of uh, have you done your homework, have you got your stakeholders aligned and particularly is your team with you. You don't want to be the leader who's way out in the front, you know, waving the flag, tilting at the windmill and you turn around and there's no point. I have a slight twist to this question though. Yeah, a lot of us, I mean not in the room I presume, are second generation of the papers. And that's where some of the conflict sometimes <coughs> tends to come in. There is the, the founder or the father figure, and there is a second generation entrepreneur who's come in with the son. And now the son wants to take risks, but somebody wants to say, you know, hold on a minute, I don't want to do this. That's, I think, more. <laughs> and I can speak here for myself. I have my nephew running the business, and I know the kind of conflict I go through. With him, so. I want your nephew. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, uh, how do we address something like this? You know, because I'm sure that's something which is in everybody's mind is, you know, how do I tell my dad or my uncle, no, 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 I'm going to do this even though you don't like this. Like this. What are the thoughts? Yeah, How do you handle that? Yeah, okay. it's natural that uh, such conflicts are occur, and actually quite healthy. Mm -hmm. Especially when the next generation comes in, they, they have a different mindset. They logically, I think they would have studied more than their parents or their uncles. Um, so it is bound to occur. There's nothing wrong, first of all, if you are a young person to say that uh, my thinking is different from my elders. You know. I think the key thing is how do we move forward. And that's where uh, a lot will depend on the end dialogue we have with elders. And um, I guess speaking, if you can be able to convince them fully, then that's the best option. But if you're not able to convince them fully, I would say there are two options. One is to, if you have a new business idea or if you want to do something different, you need to tell them, okay, let me prototype that in a small market. See what is, what is the result. And if we align that, okay, if I invest a mix amount in terms of, say, recruiting of 20, 10 people in the state, it is going to lead to a certain result, and if that is achieved, then allow me to go from one state to a region, or from one region to a national, in terms of expansion. So I think it's very important that you pace it out with so the elders and uh, de risk by prototyping it. It's a good thing to prototype because you also go through a learning curve. So from all angles, prototype is good, but only thing it leads to a certain delay. So if the opportunity is going to run away because of lack of time, then you may just want to question whether it is worth prototyping. But by and large, I've seen that prototyping uh, is a very good option as long as the opportunity is not going to run away. And arrived in actual standard with the director and say that okay, this is the risk. I'm reducing the risk by one tenth. And let's arrive at an action standard, and if that is achieved, then I will allow me to grow. Because then you have to break that resistance. You can't have two positions, uh, two people taking positions. You know? Because if you're not allowed to expand, you will feel demotivated. If you go in a big expansion mode and if it doesn't work out, then you will, your job is at risk. You know? So there is always a way out of prototyping and breaking that that uh, bottleneck. And that's not necessarily with the elder and the younger generation. It happens internally also. You know? between a boss and a subordinate. You know, and I think I've seen the best way is to allow me to experiment and prototype at a, at a much smaller scale. Because again, <coughs> you know, we go on discussing, we go on doing so much research, and I always tell my team, our market research has limitations, huge limitations. You know, don't 
let market dis research decide for yourself. You may want to test your hypothesis, but you can't market research decide what you will do. And the best way to do is to actually be in the market. There is no way any consumer research is going to say that this product is going to succeed beyond a point. You have to put that product in the market and test out the hypothesis. And it's, it's quite complex because you know you have the consumer, the product reaction, price, in our case, FMCG packaging. Uh, so there are so many things which, so many variables <coughs> which you can look at and then it's very difficult to capture all that in market research. And the best way is to, rather than delaying the whole thing, you know, is to do a rapid prototype and be in the market and use that prototyping as a way to learn. I think the most important is, it's not go no more. But prototyping is an opportunity to make you learn. <coughs> and if need be, you go on making variations in your prototype model. For example, in a state you want to grow by, you know, I want to employ 10 people. And that's not working out because it's too expensive. Then you may say, okay, let me cut it down to five and see whether it's going. So you go and it's an active experimentation lab and that's the mindset you need to have. And if it is active experimentation lab, it is the whole objective is to meet the action standards and achieve a good financial viability of the prototype project. <coughs> uh, and if you can do it to prototype for one or two years or so until you get the actual results. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so I think we've kind of heard from the experts that <coughs> growth <coughs> strategy <coughs> essential in moving forward. <coughs> I've got a bunch of specific strategy questions which people have asked. I'm going to just try and go through as many as I can in a short time so I will address some of your your questions. Now, uh, it may not be in any specific order, so please bear with me. Okay? I'm wondering whether after answering, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just leaving it to you. After answering, there may be some other you want to some, some clarification, something or otherwise. I leave it to you, whichever is the format you want to do it. Yeah. So what we do is we kind of take the questions which have been coming and in Let advance. them write down. And then if there is, suppose if I have said something on right. separate right. Thing, right. And somebody wants a clarification. Yes, somebody we, has to we do that uh, after yeah. the first break yeah. that we do. Yeah, so we've got to. We okay. take a. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm kind of going through the. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Anji, this is to you. Uh, the, you know, what is the primary strategy an SME needs to think about when they're looking at moving from an SME to a large industry kind of background? Okay. And is it sales team? Mm -hmm. Is it having right promotional activities or is it production capacity? Now, they've given three, but if there's anything else which you'd like to specifically ask about, that would be great. Good. Um, I would say actually all of the above, depending on what your business is, obviously you have a stronger bias for one versus the other. Mm -hmm. If it's a consumer business, then there's marketing, there's sales, uh, pricing, placement, packaging, and so on. If it's an enterprise type business, B2B business, then you think about it slightly differently. Then your consumer brand, consumer marketing is less important. What's more important is enterprise sales, uh, relationship management, key account management, and other types of skills. But I think at the heart of all of it is uh, what's your core organizational capacity? And the core organizational capacity is yourself, your core team, senior team, and other people and process systems. So that's really core organizational capacity. Everything else builds from there. So in the process of scaling, when you go from a mid-sized enterprise to a large size, and you, regardless of what numbers we put around them and say this is SME and this is large, I think that is at the center. Um, for, for there to be a strong, let's say, a marketing strategy, you need to have terrific marketing muscle. You need to have a great marketing leader. You need to have an understanding of branding. Um, again, if you don't have it in-house, should you <coughs> recruit? You need to bring them in-house to recruit. Or do you find sometimes, because you know, if you're not able to get the best person, you're at a scale that you're not able to attract the right talent, is then find a, or create for yourself a network of advisors, which is, again, not an ideal long-term solution, but it can be a short-term fix. So you may get 50% of a really terrific marketing resources capacity, which is better than zero. And it may actually be better than 100% of a very mediocre resource either. So there are different ways to building it. Um, but again, at the core of it is all the things I said earlier. Uh, be very clear about what your business is. Are you a consumer business? Are you a B2B business? Is it something that is a long sales cycle, in which case you have to think about it differently, versus a short burst to market? Um, 
uh, if your business is something that you, where you can utilize and so, you know digital marketing much more flexibly, smartly, and so on, then that's a skill set you need to have. So where you spike, I think for all enterprises there is a basic bar on capability. So beyond that bar, what you spike in, what your expertise is as a business, should be linked to really what your uh, long-term vision, long-term plan is. You know, there's a burning desire to grow, and, if, and sometimes what happens is you're really growing really well and fast, and that's why you're saying, oh, "Great, I've, I'm I'm on fire. Let's time to scale." What are the watchouts? You know, because it's it's you know, people like to say, "Hey, I, I can do no wrong." <laughs> so some watchouts are for everybody. That's my essentially. to use a metaphor, you know, there's a saying that don't get too far out ahead of your skis. When you're skiing downhill, you're gaining momentum. The key thing is they keep telling you don't lean too forward. Because if you lean too forward, you will get into a role which you can't get out of. So there is a very nuanced balance. There is a position which allows you to go on speed but not getting too far ahead of your skis. So, that's what I put over to the expert and say, so what is that position? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, one other thing which is on risk management, you know, mm -hmm. risk management you should not think, you know, you have to be risk free. Uh, it's like driving a car without brakes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you need brakes. So it's in very important for you to evaluate what is the risk. And ideally speaking, when you are on a growth agenda, you have to identify where you can go wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important whether it is cash flows or whether it is you see it's not happening. So I think it's very important because everything will not occur as per your plan. You know. Things will change. So it's very dynamic the business uh, and it will definitely be different than what you thought so, especially in a new business. So it's very important that you are fully clued in terms of how your original plan versus what you are doing is different and what are the key reasons and where do you need to shift. Uh, and I think that, that ideally speaking, when you're in a growth cycle, you just need to ideate first what can go wrong uh, with the team and then be watchful of those areas. And every few months or maybe at a certain time frame, you need to evaluate what was the original plan versus where you are today and what are the implications of that shift in whatever you achieve. Uh, do you need to protect yourself in terms of more cash flows or whatever else, you know? So I think it's very dynamic those situation and you have to go on reviewing it. It need be every 15 days with you and your team because uh, you don't want to fall flat. You may just be doing well, but all of a sudden you realize that you don't have any money. Right. So you have to go on, you have to have a very strong grip on your business in terms of where it is going. And the CEO has to have their grip. To me, a good CEO should have very good grip in numbers and should have a very good pulse of the organization in terms of where it is headed. I think that's a key aspect of one good CEO is to have a very good pulse in terms of not only the financial numbers, but how are the people feeling, how are the customers doing, what is the growth opportunity because if the CEO has set that pulse then his ability to predict future, take risks, contain risks, I think that will play very important. It need not be just CEO but the CEO and his team. So I would say concurrent uh, critique um, and also tracking the progress and there are <coughs> deviations, what can you do about it? And, and, and you come to, a, you mentioned the word CEO multiple times. Now, in our, a lot of us entrepreneurs are probably founders and CEOs yes, yes. both together and sometimes founders don't think they can they can go wrong or <laughs> which is which is sometimes the problem. Um, the question I think which I want to bring up is a couple of questions from a founder point of view is when should a founder say I'm done and walk away because keep in mind what's happening with Uber and stuff like that you're seeing that a large organization like that but even for a smaller organization what's the right not a time from an age point of view but from a milestone perspective is it, is it time to bring in a professional board into your you know, CEO into the company and second is okay how do you let the CEO get wings to actually be successful because that's another thing which I think is a, is a challenge for a lot of a lot of first generation entrepreneurs especially. So on the perspective, how should I go? So I wanted to add one point around um, 
how do you create sort of the braking system around you? Mm -hmm. Because uh, in uh, early or mid-stage enterprises, the founder is the CEO. So whereas you might have that, you know, the founder by nature is a risk taker, is someone who is optimistic and so on and so forth. And not to say that you should not be optimistic, but if it's not in you, so self-awareness is very important. You know, if it is not in you to think about all the things that can go wrong, please recognize that, that it is not in my nature to acknowledge the things that can go wrong and think rationally about them. If it's not in your nature to do that, some people are able to do both, but if it's not in your nature to do that, find people around you who can do that for you and with you. It could be your colleague, it could be your uh, CEO or Chief Operating Officer, whatever the, it could be your CFO. But someone who you respect, who's a peer in the business, in your team, or someone outside. Um, I've seen situations, I personally have situations where, you know, my mentor, I, I make sure there are at least a couple of people around me who are going to ask me tough questions. And in that moment, you might not like to hear it. But if you respect them and you've empowered them to ask you tough questions, it will at least act as that breaking mechanism for you. So I think it's very important to have that around you. Um, but as you scale up and then if you have the ability to get some, I think CFOs play a wonderful role in organizations where they're able to ask these tough questions and say, I'm sorry, it's my job, I'm going to ask you these difficult questions. That's a very nice thing to have on your team, to have colleagues and, and a culture that is uh, open to dissent and debate, very respectful, open to dissent and debate. Um, when do you bring in an external CEO and how do you give space? And I think you're looking at the master here. So I'm not even going to try and address that. I, I'd love you to also give a perspective I will, I will, because you've dealt with us by always viewed as Oh my God, he's got this massive organization in front of him, he's done this. No, we all so believe Many years ago, Ashbhai, when you did this the first time. <laughs> let's let's go back to those days. <laughs> no, I think I'll just to continue her story. I agree that, I think, as I put it first, what is good for the organization comes first. So I think from an organizational point of view, if you are the founder, are you doing justice to, to the organization? Are you the best CEO or can there be somebody better than you? Just because you found it doesn't mean that you have to continue. I think the organization will just come first because if you are not doing a good job as a CEO, then it's better to either get a replacement from outside or in time. Ideally speaking, internally, the company is doing that. And give the reins to that person. I think the second thing which goes into this is what is, at that particular stage, what is my personal aspiration? What do I want to do in my life? So sometimes you may be a very good CEO, but now I've lost that fire. I've lost that, I want to do something else. I want to reinvent and try to do something else. So that could be another trigger where you, you step down and you bring in another CEO. Now, I mean, specifically asking about my own personal example, you know, I stepped down as CEO about three years back and I, I never thought at that time that I stepped down. But I think ultimately it so happened that uh, I had kept a certain age and everybody decides you know, at what age you step down. It occurred prior to what I had thought so. But I again wore the cap of what is good for the organization comes first because if there is an individual who is an internal person who is good and who aspires to be in your shoes, then if you don't give that opportunity, there is a threat of losing that person. Then you need to take a call whether I want to lose that person or I want to stick on to my earlier <laughs> time frame of whatever, two, two years later, you know. And then I discussed <coughs> that with the board and we arrived at that where the guy stepped down. So <coughs> also that is good for the organization. Any step down and those who are I mean, it's something which is easier said than done, you know. Because you are full time involved to business and all of a sudden you your involvement would be in my case is about twenty five percent in the company. So what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, as I said, reinvent yourself and you, but at that particular point of time, there is always that uncertainty, that fear, you know, will I have enough things to do? So you have to start sowing your initiatives, whether it's a new business or a new, 
social venture or helping others or board of directors or whatever else which is going to keep you occupied. Because you have to be mentally occupied, that's for clear. You, know. you cannot just mm -hmm. enjoy life, okay? You may increase the number of holidays, you know, <laughs> once in a blue moon, you play, may play golf on a weekday, <laughs> but beyond that, you have to be occupied fully. You know. Completely different, you know, and my typical day is very, very different from the next day, you know. So today my whole day virtually is for asset, you know. <laughs> But I will have business review, I will have review with my son, family office, SN, the Innovation Foundation. There are two, three other things, new business I'm pursuing. So there are lots of things uh, which is, I'm finding it, I'm finding it very interesting to handle a variety of issues. And it's good for the organization also because it has sent a very strong signal down the line in the corporate world. Normally, it, yeah, very few, or there have been some examples where uh, promoters, you have stepped down and got in a professional person. Mm -hmm. So it has sent a very strong positive signal in the in the corporate governance area as well as to all our investors. With all this a fear, okay, after you, you know, who's, uh, what is succession plan? Harsh, if I may, just ask a clarificatory question. Sorry. Just um, think because that, that is what we decide that we will have all sessions later on and we will do it. And okay. That's the process we want to Thank you. Yeah. Otherwise it will become... Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But note it down in principle. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I would also like to underscore one thing that I mentioned here, which is the clarity in your mind on what is good for the organization and your business may not always be aligned with what is good for you and vice versa. So there comes a time in the life cycle of an enterprise where what's right for the founder should become smaller than what is right for the enterprise. Ultimately, the institution has to be larger than the individual. And uh, again, without ascribing any judgment around it, uh, but it's it's what you are aspiring to build. If you're aspiring to build a business that supports you, then you're at the center of it. But if you're <coughs> aspiring to build an institution that outlives you and leaves a legacy and so on, then very soon the institution should become larger than yourself. And your employees, your customers, your stakeholders, shareholders, all of that should come before. Just to add, sorry, go ahead. When we had a, we had a very nice framework when I started working at McKinsey, it was client, team, firm, then me. What comes first is your client. We are, it's a privately held partnership firm, right? So there are no listed shareholders, otherwise it would have been shareholders. So client, then your team, then the firm and then yourself. So I, I've always found that a very useful hierarchy to keep in at the heart of what you're doing. Interesting. So just to add a few things which are related to this question, related to what is happening in India. And I think two sets of issues as one well, highlight, though it's not a part of the question, but I think it's interesting because uh, when you step down, uh, normally the founder, and I've, we've seen it in two corporate big cases where the corporates have been very high on governance, very, very, very highly respected, <coughs> but they landed themselves into this, into this controversy of how to handle succession. Um, I think the key thing is to be aligned first. Uh, if you're stepping down, then what do you expect out of the CEO? And what is going to be your role, what is going to be your CEO? And when I say aligned, it has to be put in it down in writing. So my board of directors told me to put it down in writing and go back with them. So I wrote down what will be my new role. And the MD, the correct MD, took over from me. He wrote down what will be his role and then we compared. <coughs> we had a very high degree of overall uh, concurrence in terms of what should be the role and wherever there was some, we clarified that. And it goes on to great detail like what, which investor will I meet, you know, where, what will be my role in image building or PR stories, you know. How will I get involved in day-to-day -to -day business? So I have like monthly review with me and this team. I have skip level meetings. I have, I have PR will be mainly, medical related will be his. I will be more PR on the macro issues and things like that. So there is very high clarity in terms of what I am going to do and what you want. And we go on reviewing that also once in a few months. Is it working well? And I think that dialogue and they have written down role of me and this has really helped. And many a times I've seen in case of whether it's Tata or Infosys, that was lacking, there was no alignment. 
to them. The other is what does the founder expect in terms of what needs to be continued. And again, the Infosys it is a clear example. And the founders had certain expectation in terms of values, culture, and it didn't happen. But that had to be aligned. So I, I wrote down and the, the MD as well as the board, the values of the organization, the purpose of the organization, the strategy of the organization. And all these three were discussed with the MD as well as the board. And we were completely aligned. Not to say that the strategy will not change, but for the timing, this is the strategy. If there is change, again, we'll have a dialogue at the board level and come back. But there is no ambiguity in terms of a certain values. You know, everybody is aligned and then we also have arrived, arrived at the base of which we will we will we will measure our culture once in two years. So I think this whole exercise of what the founder expects the organization to do, even if he is not there, and what is his role when he steps down, has to be handled very carefully. And it cannot just be you handle it and then it leads to because there is normal tendency, okay Maybe or to know, <laughs> go a little bit more. But here it's very, very clear. Yeah, you know, yeah. And all these two examples are clear. Clear. I mean, there are a lot of learning out of this. And luckily, we did it well, so we have not had any problem. Fantastic. Okay. Hey, that's a great learning. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, moving to professional services businesses, and you mentioned Infosys as one. But I think a question which people want to know is. It's very tough to scale a professional services business because there's a lot of people involved. So you worked with McKinsey before and you've worked with multiple people. Anjali, how do you go about scaling a professional services business? Good question. So I um, actually had the opportunity to start and scale a professional services business here. And so when we started Spencer Stewart in India, nobody knew the firm. It was a very big firm overseas, and the US is the number one firm, and so on and so forth, but nobody knew it in India. And uh, we came into the market 10 years after three other large firms had already been here. And you know, initially, I would get questions like, oh, Spencer's, you've joined retail? I didn't know you were a retail person. I'm like, no, 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 this is not Spencer's from Chennai in retail. Yeah. <laughs> Spencer Stewart, professional services, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so lots of learnings along the way, but I think, you know, is, if you think about factors of production, the, the single factor of production in a professional services firm, we can talk about intellectual capital and all of that, all of that is true, it's there, you have knowledge, you have intellectual capital, but the single factor of production in a professional services firm is people. And you don't get people in because you have terrific intellectual capital. You get people in because they think they are going to grow, they are going to learn, and the professional services animal, the DNA of a professional services person, is very driven by learning and knowledge and impact and contribution. It is somewhat different from other industries. So those kind of people like to be around other similar kind of people. They want to be continuously challenged, they want to feel they are continuously growing, they want to feel continuously recognized and rewarded and loved. So it's a very high touch management of professional services people. And the only way you grow your business is by getting great people and letting them go. And so if there are folks here who are building what we call PSFs, professional services firms, please know that your biggest role is to supplement yourself. You have to, you have to come last. Everybody else has to come ahead of you. Um, and one thing I found quite useful is to keep reminding people, and this, by the way, this is also a very type A competitive type of DNA, uh, to keep reminding people that together you will win, together you will win. Um, and it is better to have a smaller slice of a larger pie than to have a large slice of a very small pie. And the only way you grow that pie is to get more people on board. And then nurture them let them grow, let them flourish. As a leader, you take more and more of a back seat, but you are there, you are the safety net, you are the backstop. You are there to lead from the front and do all the difficult things, but get used to getting all the bad phone calls, unhappy clients, things that are not working well. Let the glory, let the credit go to others, and that's how you build the PSP. 
Uh, yeah, but just taking one step forward, people obviously very, very important, but I think a big factor in everybody's mind is sales. You know, how do you actually go about bringing in marquee customers when you are, uh, you know, <laughs> as you're building a firm? Right. So, you are sort of chief salesman. <laughs> you are the, you're the chief janitor. You are the chief salesman. So, janitor, what I mean is it's a very important task. Huh? That's why I start with that. All the cleanup you have to do. It's because nobody else wants to do the cleanup. You are the chief salesman because you have to go get the business. Um, at the same time, you can't always be the chief salesman. At some point, you have to become head of business development, so you're doing more strategic sales versus everyday sales and so on, and then eventually become head of content, and if you think about boxes and the labels on those boxes. But yes, um, I think the, the, a somewhat underrated sales tool is fabulous client delivery. Sorry, say that again. Fabulous? Fabulous client delivery. If you deliver value, you will get business. So rather than focusing at a certain point in time, you have to do initial sales and so on, but at a certain point in time, as a leader, your, your focus has to shift a little bit into saying, are we hitting the ball of the park every single time for our clients? And if you do that, then you will have repeat business. And when you have repeat business, you need to do less sales. You're, you're doing less pitching. So I think the best sales tool is very, very good client work. Um, and just I, I think the same thing, by the way, goes for anything that has a customer. It could be an enterprise technology business. Good. It could even be a consumer business. Right? If you're delighting your consumers all the time with a great product, they'll keep coming back to you. And one final question on professional services. Does it make sense to scale by doing inorganic acquisitions? and use that as a way to create scale? Or would you <coughs> recommend more the traditional organic route of doing that? I've seen both work. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of my career in firms that don't believe in inorganic growth. Mm -hmm. So they haven't acquired other professional services firms and so on, because the <coughs> view was that when you have a strong culture, and remember again, PSFs are very strong cultures, that's what makes them successful. Mm -hmm. you know, Accenture has a very different culture from a TCS. If you try and merge the two, can you imagine? So there is, a, there is one point of view in the professional services world that you cannot actually create a, a sustainable, effective merger of firms like that. And so I've spent time in firms that haven't grown inorganically, haven't acquired, and because we don't believe it can be integrated and be made to be effective. On the other hand, We've actually seen a lot of consolidation, whether it is the big four space or is the tech services space or even the strategy consulting space. So we've seen a lot of consolidation, and clearly there is there are some firms that have chosen to grow inorganically, and uh, they have been able to make it work. I was uh, talking with somebody at uh, <coughs> PwC, which acquired Booz, yeah. and sort of chalk and cheese businesses. So Booz has now become strategy and with the PwC, and I said. I asked them how many partners have stayed and so on. So they gave me the numbers. As expected, a large number of the partners had left. However, they were able to move up their average fee significantly. So their purpose was met. I think there's, yeah. It's worked out well. Yeah. It's worked out well for them. Yeah. Interesting, okay. So there's no yes or no. It's can you integrate? Can you integrate, integration. Okay, uh, Ashpa, a separate question, you know, very often. Uh, I'm sorry, one final point on this. Actually, in the technology world, there's been a lot of inorganic growth in tech services because you may have only where you can get it is at the higher. Okay. So this whole notion of acquiring a company to get the talent is very prevalent in the technology world. A little bit shift from professional services, but very often when an entrepreneur wants to scale or start and work in a new geography, uh, say US or UK or something, one of the approaches they tend to take is build a partnership, you know, get get a partner in place. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. What is your take on on creating partnerships for entering a new new geography from a See, let me precede that by talking about what one should do when you enter a new geography. It's, it's 
very important that you study where you're going. Okay. And when I say study, it means if you're a consumer product, then look at the consumer habits. Look at if you're trying to advertise the media scenario, you will look at the, how, is, how stable is that economy, what is the exchange rate, what how vulnerable it is. So it's very, very important to get a very good grip of macros uh, and competitive scenario before when you decide to enter new geography. And it's very, very different compared to compared to your home market. So you have to be aware of what you're stepping into because you mm -hmm. may get hit. And the chances of you getting it are more in those markets because you're not you're not as strongly based as in the home market. For example, we entered Egypt and nobody had thought of the Egyptian revolution. Now again, the Egyptian currency is uh, down by 50% in one year. So these are risks of entering your markets. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, uh, my experience was that it is more risky to enter your markets because of the fact that you go through the micro and you're not able to predict what is going to happen because you are staying in the far away. So that's, that's one. Having decided to enter, whether you should do it on your own or whether you should do it in, through a partnership, something will depend on what is the role of the partner is to play. Uh, and is it very well defined? Uh, it need not be a joint venture, it could be an alliance. I've seen joint ventures, most joint ventures at least in India have not succeeded. I personally have a mindset against joint ventures, but that doesn't mean that you should not look at joint ventures because uh, a lot of time goes into aligning joint venture partners' thoughts with your thoughts you know, in terms of the business, the execution. And it takes a lot of energy in terms of managing a joint venture. Uh, there have been joint ventures which have succeeded, so I'm not saying no, but I think you have to go through the case of and fundamentally, I think what is your value and what is that joint venture partner value and you have to be very, very clear. In some cases, because of government regulations, you are not able to establish a new country, so you are forced to go to a joint venture partner. So that's completely different now, mm -hmm. because it, it is imperative for you to be a present in country uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and the country doesn't allow you to be on your own then you go to a joint venture because that's that's what is expected. But again, you choose a joint venture in that case which is best suited to you. So the choice of joint venture also is after having clarity in terms of why you want a joint venture is, is very, very important. And then you need to have the right chemistry with that partner. And if there is uneven size, as I've seen, you know, if your size is 100 million, a joint venture size is 1 billion, then you will at your end, you will be dealing at your level, but you will be dealing with three levels, <laughs> somebody three levels down. And it's very difficult to do that, you know, because then that person will have to get alignment to the top. So when you have one even sizes, it becomes far more complicated. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just again, switching courses, but detail. You know, there are some obviously retailers in the in the room, and uh, you know the question they have is, it's really retail takes a lot of money to scale. Uh, what would be your take on that, Anjali? You know, how would you, what would you recommend to retailers today in uh, in India from a scaling perspective? What should the approach they should be taking? Um, so there's a big overall point of view on India macro retail, so I won't go there. Okay. <laughs> enough and more out there on what's the format. It is still unclear in mm. India whether it is a big box, small box, Kirana, what is going to win, what is clear is a big box is not clear. I'm not even going there and I'm not sure if anyone wants to know specifically about that. Um, I think retail is a tough business. I don't have as much exposure to it myself, but it's a, it's a old business, so there's a lot of science around it. And this enormous amount of knowledge available on how to do retail. Uh, like real estate, 
what my retailer friends tell me is all about location of your store. So it's the location, location, location. Picking the right location, uh, managing store operations extremely tightly. So good retailers have such an amazing knack um, and appetite for the detail of every day what sells where. So you on merchandising and so on. So why in India is your Kirana store the most successful retailer? Because he has just an incredibly nuanced and detailed understanding of his customer. So his micro market, his merchandising strategy, what he stocks in that little shop, he stocks everything his customers need. And if, he's, if he finds a, a, a requirement from a customer that he doesn't have, he takes it, you know, he puts it somewhere in the database in his head, he does the analytics there and makes sure it is there next month. So, but now retail, of course, is a is quite much more scientific. Uh, there's enormous amounts of sort of data-based approaches and analytical approaches to running retail. But ultimately, it comes around to uh, what format are you in? Um, what is the kind of market you're serving? So, what's your business development or store rollout strategy? And then the very tight management of store operations. And, and many retailing companies, you have different people there are some people who are very, very good at store operations. And this is what they've done for 40 years. And there are others who are much more business development oriented, are thinking digital, and are thinking how do I do omni-channel and so on. Very different skills. And you bring up a great point about omni-channel. You know, with the big elephant in the room with Amazon, Flipkart, or all around, what would your recommendation be, Harsh, by former four retailers that how seriously should they look at E as a, as a platform? and in India specifically? So I think depending on retail again is a very broad term. Mm -hmm. E-commerce, <coughs> depending on what you're doing, 2% of e-commerce may vary substantially. Mm -hmm. uh, in FMCG business, e-commerce contribution is 1% of as okay. Well. okay. But that doesn't mean that you ignore that, it's growing. But in some other businesses, it can be 20, 25 So I think a lot will depend on to what extent e-commerce is disruptive to your business in general. And what is it likely to be? And how do you overcome that threat? So some existing retailers have tried to go into e-commerce themselves, but I don't think many of them succeeded. So in that case, how can you improve your own business model? to ensure that you are not losing business to the e-commerce person. This is a big challenge you have to, you have to see. I don't have, I don't have an answer, answer but, I, don't have an answer, but uh, I think a lot will depend on what extent are you vulnerable to e-commerce threat uh, and how can you overcome that through innovation, through good services, or wherever something which they are not able to offer. Ajli, you have a take on this? So the, uh, I think the emerging new way is that the consumer will increasingly want both. So they will want that physical offline experience, the touch, the feel, the trial, and they will want the ability to browse and comparison shop and shop for the best price online. So we are starting to see from a bit of a convergence coming about where all traditional retailers are exploring digital and own e-commerce. The own e-commerce is unclear what its success will be. Um, as Hush mentioned, I think it's not really succeeded for almost every major retailer, with a few <coughs> exceptions, a couple of exceptions. But for the most part, they are very much stuck in that whole model. And also, by the way, their technology systems don't enable and support this very rapid prototyping that is required in digital e-commerce. On the other hand, when you go to the online players, they know digital, they know data, they know how to do digital customer acquisition, they don't know how to run retail. And they are actually very different skill sets. They are also different businesses with very different unit economics. So when you are running an online business and you are used to seeing very rapid prototyping, very rapid scale up, and you can change your prices dynamically, for example, you cannot do that in offline retail. So I think we are starting to see a convergence where the consumer today has been exposed to both and wants the best of both. Hence, omni-channel, which is easier said than done, but we are starting to see some places. Yes, that's why Amazon bought Whole Foods. 
in a way. <laughs> Amazon bought Whole Foods for, um, I think they bought Whole Foods for $12 billion. Yes. Their stock price went up by 15. Yeah. <laughs> so it more than paid for itself. <laughs> But grocery is a whole different segment. Yes, it's a whole different category. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, there's a question from somebody on the financial services side. You know, we all look for of Uday Kotak. He's a guy who went from individual to institution. Any other such names you can think of? I think that somebody wants to be inspired by somebody other than Uday Kotak, <coughs> who is obviously very, very well known in in the India who is in the financial services was moved, you know, become an institution and from the individual founder. I couldn't think of anybody else because there was anybody Not right. as diverse in terms of whatever he has done, you know, starting with bank to <coughs> in MBFC to investment banking to insurance to uh, stressed assets acquisition. Yeah, I don't think anybody has done that. Not quite that. Not that quite that. Yeah. Three, four Gujaratis who were doing well earlier in the market, Hemant Rapatari, and yeah, you're right. Yes. These three, Uday and the other two, <laughs> one sold, the other two, <coughs> not done as well. Yeah. The other ones, actually. Okay, the Pachari are good examples of yes. others. I can't think I of as that. Rashesh. Rashesh also, Rashesh also. Rashesh, you're not sure. Mutila, Mutila, Swala. But they've not done to the extent, you know. Not to the extent, not to the breadth. And even in terms of marketing, they haven't done that. 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 They haven't HD5 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 the company's innovation cycle and the fund's life do not necessarily uh, coexist and do not uh, the same thing. Uh, and experimentation very often hurts profitability. Uh, so what is, you know, with that in mind, how do you balance that and what's the ideal time to, uh, to scale up in an environment where you have different forces pulling on, <laughs> on you? I don't think anybody's got the answer, least of all me. <laughs> Somebody figures it out, please write a book, and then you will never need to work again. But yes, uh, um, I, it's, it's a difficult one. I think we are still in probably sort of the second cycle of VC in India. Because I think in, um, there is some rapid prototyping happening in this place also, by the way. The issue is, of course, that the stakes are very high. There's large amount of capital involved. And for better or for worse, everything plays out in the media. So, you know, ordinarily you would have some space as an entrepreneur and as the set of investors around the table. So if you think about it as the enterprise, forget the entrepreneur and the investors for a minute. What is at the heart of it? At the heart of it is still the enterprise. There are a lot of customers, a lot of employees, there's a lot of capital invested. So you would think that the health of the enterprise should come first. But the practical reality is the entrepreneur wants to do something. You may have four or five funds around the table, all of whom are in different times. In somebody may <coughs> have come in five years earlier, and so now they need to exit. Somebody came in a year earlier, they don't need to exit. Somebody's fund life is coming to an end. So I think there's a lot of complexity when you think around the in interests that sit around the table versus the interest of the enterprise itself. Uh, from the enterprise point of view, you should obviously continuously innovate and continuously grow and continuously strive for profitability. <coughs> but the practical reality is you also have to be cognizant of your stakeholders. So sooner or later, as founders, when you start raising money, you, and that is again a very important reason to build a robust team because you will spend time in fundraising and investor management, investor relations, as you should. You've taken other people's money, you're responsible for it. So, you know, the opium, opium should not become addictive. <laughs> it should not lull you into a stupor. You should think about opium as other people's money, which has to be given back with healthy returns. So it has to be managed. Okay. Fair point. And again, that, that very open, transparent dialogue, 
uh, is super important. Uh, you just have integrity around everything. And it's easier said than done. I've talked about scaling up. I think the question which some of them have is, when is, you know, while I'm in the process of scaling, when do I kind of pull the brakes in? You know, what is it, you know, what are, I mean, you mentioned some of the factors that we need to link fence and stuff. But, you know, when do you say if scaling results are not happening, we should say stop. And sometimes also, there is a business which is running for a while. The product is now becoming non-viable, but it yet delivers, meets expenses, it does everything. How do you phase that out? And bringing in new products, which takes time. So it's kind of a, you know, a question which is more about what do I do if I can't scale? You know, I'm not successful in scaling, or my business is right now in a, in a problem. Uh, I'm not making money, but 65% of my revenue is thanks to a product which is dying gradually. What kind of uh, approach do we take? And I'm sure you've you had these these kind of challenges with multiple products you've launched before. Sir, first of all, you don't have to be emotional about it. You know, because many times you have started something, you're so emotionally involved that you forget the rational part of and you talk it about it that you uh, are mm -hmm. Or you are scared that what will others think if I just continue. So that scare of what others think and the emotional attachment should not be there in the decisions. The other way to look at is one question is, suppose if I had to start that business today would I have started. So if the answer is no, then automatically then you won't have a right to be in the business. A lot will depend on to what extent have you made investments mm -hmm. in a capital plan, drawing people, and if you discontinue that, what are going to be the implications of that? So you have to evaluate that. So I, I don't have an answer, but I'm just saying that so keep the emotions out, so keep the fear of what others will say out. Ask question if I could start restart the business. If I had to start the business, same business today, would I have started? And then, unless if you have to close down, what are the implications of closing down? You don't want to close down and then say, I am saddled with so much losses because I have so much fixed costs which I cannot reduce, or so much of interest or capital investment. So sometimes you continue just to keep that ship going you know, because you have a certain fixed cost or capital investment which is supporting this. Okay. I think that's great. I mean, not being emotional is probably essential. <coughs> uh, I'm just going to ask the room for how much time do we have left? Another 10 minutes before we take a break. Okay, so I don't have much we time. We open the QA after the break. Okay, no, because there's a bunch of yet questions. So I'm going to, uh, okay, so then I'm going to, I'm going to start on talk time. If you have some more time, you can ask it in, in, in the QA, please. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, how does one attract top level talent when you're a small business? And that's something which everybody talks about. And then now with, unfortunately, the whole approach was ESOPs and stuff like that which were being given. But then with the housing and the snap deal and all the not so elegant situations <laughs> which have arisen, ESOPs don't now be aren't as attractive as they were maybe before when people were being, you know, granting them to attract top level talent. So, what would be your take, Harsh? I know you have done this before multiple times, so I will ask you this question. <laughs> See, a lot will depend on your current size and to what extent you have an image in the job market. You know? mm -hmm. If you are too small and if you don't have any image, then it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. So you need to arrive at a strong employee value proposition to attract talent. Ideally speaking, that value proposition should be something which others are not able to or wherever you are targeting to attract talent, you need to have some differentiator. In our case, at the time when we started Marico, it was a new company, so we had to, there was no image in the job market, so we had to create an image, and we, we arrived at our employee value proposition, which was, we were going to empower it, because in FMCG industry, when you were competing companies which were MNCs, there was, less empowerment because a lot of decisions were taken by somebody sitting abroad. So we thought that is a good differentiator mm -hmm. to attract talent and we leveraged on that and we discussed that with uh, internally and amongst the head on course. And we said that this is something unique which we are offering, the empowerment, the culture of organization, the career option, the growth. And we want you to say this story when you want to attract talent. I think that helped us a lot. So I think the things, do 
doing all that work. But if you are too small, you are really at a, there's a, there's a war for talent. And I think most CEOs are mis underestimating that role they have to play to attract talent. They have to play a very active role um, in terms of the image of the organization, what it stands for. A lot of people who want to join you, they will ask the people, ex-employees who left you. It is very important to maintain very good relations because all your ex-employees are like your ambassadors in the marketplace. And if I want to join you and if I get a very negative view about your organization from one of your ex-employees, I will never join you. So I think it's very important to look at all the stakeholders. But if you're too small, and I'm going back to my days in Bombay or industries where you sit in Majid and family managed, there was no way I could attack talent. Mm -hmm. So then I substituted that with working with individual consultants because mm -hmm. at least you got that skill gap and they were able to fill that skill gap. Because as an entrepreneur, you have to find answers, so you need to have good minds. So virtually I had a consultant for HR, <coughs> finance, marketing. And I would have somebody else who would be open to working with that consultant, some bright youngster. But that youngster, would, that consultant would provide us the the mind, the, the overall direction, and ultimately you you will see good that. That you're forced to do it because you don't you are just too small in a highly competitive market to to attract good talent. So I've seen that at that stage it worked out well, but today we don't need uh, that kind of intervention from outside because we are able to get our own good people. I don't know, I'm really able to add more like I think that's actually a very creative um, approach to getting access to the right quality of skill set if you're not able to get a full-time person on board. Um, I, think I, I see a lot of companies that are going through the scaling up process uh, struggle with balancing a little bit, should I get somebody who's experienced or somebody who's really smart? And the challenge there is that if you go for raw intrinsics, a intrinsically really, really strong person, um, at a certain size and scale, you may not be able to attract somebody who's both very intrinsically strong and very seasoned. That's where the trade-off is. Um, it's actually a very good option to create a combination. Get a smart, hungry youngster who's also got, who's rational and has got good sense and a well-managed ego that they can work with a senior consultant. So you can, today, even more than ever, today there are a lot of people who have come out of corporate careers and are keen to work more flexibly with uh, companies that are scaling up and work with entrepreneurs. They find that very exciting and are willing to give, you know, whatever it is, 30% of the time, 50% of the time. And you can make it as a part of their KRA that they're not just advising or being, providing consulting services for a particular function, whether it is HR or finance or marketing, but part of their KRA is actually mentoring and growing this person that you have in-house. You could choose to go the other way and say, I don't really need cutting edge creative thinking in finance. I just want a very, very solid CFO who has done this for 20 years and done it multiple times. Then you go the other way. And you say, I just am going to get somebody who's very seasoned, very solid. And we'll, so for different functions, I think you can arrive at different solutions. Yeah, I'll come just add, I'll just add a little bit. I think you're absolutely right in saying that you have to select somebody who has the best fit for what you require. And I've seen that many times. You may want to evaluate two or three persons. One other thing which I realized was that in evaluating and finalizing the person who consultant is going to work with who is within your organization, he has to be aligned, he has to buy in because so, you know, if he doesn't buy in then no amount of <coughs> concern or whatever saying will work out. So in that decision making you have to involve your head of finance for example if you are taking a financial support. And he should say that yes I am going to benefit from this working together with him and he has to completely and then start off in a very small project I have seen many times. It's also important for consultant to know whether is he working for the right client. You know, because so start off on a very small prototype project, and if that is working out well, then scale it up rather than going all out. I just add one thing which has worked for me well is uh, 
sometimes when you know, like CFO, you bring in a retired corporate guy, yeah. and they are happy to spend time, not really charge you three or two million stars, and, and leverage yeah, that, yeah, yeah. and that's something which has worked well for uh, yes. all the uh, people like us. And you can do the same thing for marketing, for example. Yeah. A lot of people who, and if you, if you think very practically, the retirement age in most companies is 60, 62, 65. Today, we are all in good health, living longer. People have full, lots of energy at that point. They are not really ready to hand off their books. <coughs> yes, I think I don't go to individual consumer rather than a firm. firm yeah, oh, yeah. for sure. Firm will send you a junior guy. <laughs> no, <for sure. laughs> Completely. I mean, I, I, when I say consultant, I'm talking or not of the professional services firm. I'm talking about individuals. <laughs> but you know, I think taking this forward, what people are finding is as we are scaling, very often we notice that our teams are not cutting it. You know, they're no, they were for a good for what they were when the business was smaller, now they are not able to cope with that thing. And hence a transition has to happen, right? How do we manage that and yet keep you know, your current business running, not disrupt everything? Because you know that's something which is now becoming a challenge as scaling is going on. So again, I, I, either of you please, you know, <laughs> Leave it to you. <laughs> and then so this so then, then, then you are the master, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, if you look at my own team, then they will change two, three, four times. Mm -hmm. It is a real issue. <laughs> Somebody who was very relevant at some stage, for whatever reason, because the business has become more complex or much bigger, or uh, whatever reason, that person starts losing effectiveness. I'll again go back to what I said earlier, the organizational interests come first. Mm -hmm. Is that person is not able to perform I and mean, it is interlinked you know, in an organization. If there is one weak player, then it demotivates the other. His peers, uh, because that person is not performing. So it's very important that uh, at some stage you take a call. Uh, you may have performed brilliantly in the past. And I'm not saying when I take a call, you just ask him to go straight on You put him in a role, ideally speaking, which is a different role that he may be able to do. And if that is not possible, give feedback to that person, provide training inputs. Try those approaches, but all that ultimately many times may not just work. And you have to ensure that it is in the role. But you do it in a human manner. You don't do it just all of a sudden, you know. Say that you go to college, you have to give three months, six months time. Mm -hmm. And I think the true test of that disengagement is that after that disengagement happened, you should be friends with mm -hmm. You should not have that feeling that he was. So you should do it in a very good manner, which uh, basically he perceives you as a friend. Mm -hmm. You maintain good relations. So, how do you do disengagement also? Is but you have to do it. I don't know. There's no choice. There is no choice. If you don't do it, then you'll fall behind. So don't feel guilty about doing it. Mm. And, and don't delay. Yes. Right. Most of us are very confident yes. about it. When you have a deep sense of friendship and loyalty with your early team that has worked with you. Um, and, and my learning as I was building the business, the, again, so the first people decisions are when you delay it because it's not happy for anybody. Actually, it's not even good for the individual. They know they are not performing. They are not feeling happy. They know they are not as respected as they used to be. And so actually, if you, it's not the question of what. Yeah. The what is very clear. You have to do it. It's how you do it that is important. So it's not the what, it's the how you do it. And how you do it is incredibly respectfully, <coughs> very gracefully, self-sublimating, um, giving them, and again, depending on, you know, if you're you're separating for a ethical governance reason, I think that's a no-brainer. Really that is, that is not tomorrow, that is yesterday. Yeah, so, And it has to be very crisp, very <laughs> surgical, finished, and, and a clear message of non-tolerance. But if it is really just because you know the, the organization, the enterprise has outgrown the individual, then please do them a favor and let them go and flourish somewhere else. But help them and do it nicely. Okay. I would have one last question for Rajpur and then we will kind of wrap it up, sorry, but there's 
<coughs> you'll have to ask you all your balanced questions to the panel afterwards. Uh, I think there's a requirement, somebody wants to know that they try to recruit good people from, you know, talented people from larger organizations. Yes. When they come in, yes. it takes them a long time for them to settle into the new culture and actually start delivering. Yeah. And that's when there's a big mismatch between what the employer, uh, the employer or the founder thinks and the, uh, the guy, and it just becomes a chaos. I remember in one of our huddles only we met, I think, I'm not sure who it was, he said that you know, all these guys coming in from outside are useless. You have to see the guys coming <laughs> And he actually said, raise everybody from, 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 from within. Now, what would be your take? See, I think you have to see what kind of organization the person is coming from, what is his background. If he has stayed in a large multinational, for example, or a very large organization for a long period of time, then you will really have that issue because the person is used to a certain way of working, certain systems, certain hygiene factors, and you will relatively find it very difficult to, as put it, to work with other people who have not had that background. So I think while selecting is very important not to just get swayed by a big name like Levers, mm -hmm. uh, because that your person who is supposedly he or she is in Levers for many years, not able to settle down there, you know. And that's not necessarily, at, at our level also, you know, we may have that problem. So we have to take a call to what extent that individual is the right fit for you rather than getting swayed by the experience or the company which it comes from. <coughs> and ideally speaking, the person, if that person has worked for different types of organizations, Indian companies, multinationals, I think that's that person's favor, a smaller organization, entrepreneur, because that person has gone through that experience curve and knows exactly what he's stepping into. So I think making the right choices I don't know what I mean. I completely agree, which is, uh, it's, again, it's not the what they have done, but what context they have done it in. So they may have, for example, grown a brand from X to PX, but was it in a context of a strong structure and strong systems and a very high uh, level of talent and capability around them? then they may be very effective in that context. They may not be as effective. And again, there's no black or white, no right or wrong. But they may be less effective in a context which is not as structured, doesn't have all the systems and processes in place, doesn't have that high degree of talent around them. And so I, I like to think about it in a few different ways. Um, the ideal profile are folks who have spent their early years in what we call academy companies. So, so they have learned marketing at a lever, so they've learned marketing at a Pepsi or a PNG or whatever it is. But then they have moved and gone and done a few other things. They have demonstrated that they can take professional risk in their life. They may have failed a couple of times, because from every failure there's learning. Uh, they may have worked in different kinds of organizations, different cultures, so they have shown cultural adaptability. Because remember, they'll have to make a big adaptation when they come into your organization. Um, they've shown flexibility in their approach, their ability to work with different types of people, their ability to create templates versus follow templates. And a lot of flexibility. I, and I think when you meet people, when you start interviewing them, then you get a sense of what is behind the CV. So the, the best questions to ask is not what you did. Start with what did you do? Tell me how you did it. And that how you did it tells you a lot about the person and their potential. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry you couldn't ask everybody's questions, but please feel free to ask them at the after the break. So since thanks. we had a delayed start, we should crisis. No, sure. I think you uh, you may have started with one, and then you have gone into the second one, which seems to be growing faster. Yeah. If I'm hearing you right. Yeah. Uh, we are beating the uh, industry trend. It is like three times the GDP the growth. But we are actually more than that. We are actually. From a profitability point of view, uh, it's good enough. We don't need funds. So if, if you were to break up your business by today, uh, from a revenue point of view, how much is HR services, how much is staffing? And from a profit contribution, 
which is higher, and by how much? Uh, temporary staffing is actually overblown, so it is now 90 plus percent of revenue. Revenue and 10 percent is the uh, other service because it's 100 percent. Here only it's 7 to 8 percent. That's the difference. And then from a margin contribution point of view, here the service uh, related. I mean, other services gets better revenue, but temporary staffing gives a steady revenue. So it's a it's it's large in volume, large steady volume. volume. It's volume. It's volume. Lower margin. So this is not surprising at all. Yeah. Uh, the other question is, what do you want to do? What is the kind of business you want to own and run and be associated with, etc.? And what is the overall purpose? Of so thinking that you know there's a lot more scale that you can get from temporary staffing. By all means, go ahead. And it seems to be getting more traction. Yes, please. How do you get? To, how do you do customer acquisition? Is the other question. So if you are getting customer acquisition, the staffing business is able to do it standalone. Then it is a full-fledged business versus saying that your customer acquisition actually happens from HR services and then you transition it off. Now we have uh, different sales teams and different verticals. They drive their revenues and uh, businesses separately. But there are clients which avail services from all the verticals or some of the verticals. So any downside to running both and focusing a lot on staffing. It is a dilemma. I mean, we don't know whether to focus here or here because uh, we are seeing that the, the real core competence and other services actually are getting hampered because of the complexity of staffing business. It doesn't need to be hampered. Yeah. Staffing business is not you and your team have the bandwidth to manage both. And if you're seeing some value that you are creating as a business from HR services, you could continue that. But it looks like, and I don't know what the competitive intensity is of temporary staffing. See, these are all low barriers to entry business. But once you get- Temporary staffing, yes, you're right. Very low barriers. Other, other, other services, it isn't. Yeah. So we have that you know, advantage. But also, once you get scale in temporary staffing, as you've mentioned with this team game, and so on, can grow exponentially. So if you think you have the muscle or you have the desire to do that, then by all means build it up. Okay. But then build it up not as an afterthought, that oh, it's happened, now it's growing. Okay. Um, but really focus on it, create the right strategy, what's your go-to market, how you're going to sell, are you creating the right information systems to support exponential growth. So last question, so other services should only complement the main service. I, I'm not seeing too much synergy there actually. I'm um, sorry, we, it's a very, very surface level conversation. Right. All right. Yeah. Then you need to go much deeper. Yeah, you have to go much deeper. Two, two your stakes are too big and then two minutes to answer is that yeah. it's a suicidal thing for it. Right. So and don't formulate a strategy on the basis of the conversation. It's a half your conversation, not terminable. Yeah, yeah. 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 we cannot formulate yeah. strategy. Yeah. Even though you have to do it through your own networks because I don't think there are directories or consultants or anything like that. And then on the other side, you have to do it through your own networks because I don't think there are directories or consultants or anything like that. And then after having an initial meeting, you need to check out the references see what is the best fit and after that you need to prototype with the consultant okay. in terms of Which project, means? small project and then take some risk. If that prototype doesn't work, go to somebody else. You know. All right. That's that's the right way. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think the, yeah. So you both the discussed about the strategy in short uh, or uh, <laughs> the crux. <laughs> 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 we have done something on how to prepare a business plan and all that. Uh, ultimately, that's arising out of a strategy. Once you have to find where the yeah, strategy yeah, yeah. It's again a very loaded topic, you know. You're asking a question <laughs> which cannot be answered within two minutes, you know. I think there are enough books to. Ultimately, it's going to end up being what's your product, what's your service, who's the customer, what's the pricing, how are you going to sell, where will you get revenue, where will you get profit. Yes. Uh, so uh, we are running a financial services company that's into financial planning and comprehensive wealth management. Uh, there are a uh, couple of questions that I have for all three. One is, uh, you know, when we are trying to recruit, uh, you know, new staff, uh, typically, you know, the ones with quality, I mean, with a, with a, with a lot of uh, a good background in their resume, etc., they would they prefer normally to go with the bigger brands uh, rather than with a smaller brand like us. Uh, so how does one go about, you know, getting the, the, the best of the talent, be it on the freshers or on the experience side? 
so that's one. Secondly, uh, on the lines of what appeared in the news a few days ago, like uh, you know, there are certain key employees that left uh, the big uh, investment banking firms like uh, KPMG or let's say Deloitte uh, or whatever, and they they're going and joining competition and they are taking away the clients. So there is this uh, clause that the ex-employer is now uh, putting in, uh, saying that you can't engage with the client after the employee has left. So how does one kind of safeguard that? We, we have, as of now, we have this uh, non-disclosure, non-compete clause already in our uh, appointment letter that our employees signed, but uh, how does one ensure that you know, this conflict doesn't happen. I know it's great, but these are the two thoughts that came to my mind, so thank you. I'll, I'll take the second one, the, the non, non-disclosure, non non-complete, non-solicit. So confidentiality, non-complete, non-solicit are pretty standard clauses. They're very hard to enforce, unless you have both the, the appetite and the resources to go into litigation. So <coughs> there are best deterrents, and they sometimes prevent a future employer from engaging the employee who is leaving you. And typically in situations where you actually even have the need to invoke such a clause, it's a bad departure. So it's uh, either, and I say bad departure, it's a, it's a technical term, it's a bad departure, where the bad leader who is going with malintention to actually compete with your business. There's no straight answer there. It's a tough situation if you find that an employee has walked out with a book um, and knowledge, and uh, is using that competitively. You can use it as a deterrent unless you want to actually litigate. I think that right. litigation is the biggest issue. If you're willing to take that risk to litigate, and we actually did that once. You don't know whether you'll succeed or not. Yeah, yeah you know. and when no, you're it's building a business, message. you don't want to spend time doing that. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to spend your time, bandwidth, money, resources doing litigation against an ex-employee. So you have to find a different solution. I thought I had answered your first yeah, question so in terms of employee value proposition. What is the unique thing you would offer? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have to have something unique. You have to identify what you have against uh, big multinational which is going to attract that employee. And you have to go in and dig deep properly and arrive at a proposition which is truly unique and not just for the sake of saying it. Just like I mentioned about the empowerment in say a big MNC and offering challenging careers. Uh, so you need to identify and search for a unique employee value proposition which you can leverage. And if you have one then you may be able to offer uh, something which may help that put a person attract. The other is to use your existing people like employees to leverage them as I said. Because many times uh, good HR head can also be very important to in convincing. You need to have very good HR head. I've seen that uh, it should be very res well respected, it should be articulate, it should be speaking on your behalf in terms of attracting talent. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Yeah. Uh, I'm Keena from Arce Jewelry. As my partner just mentioned about this consultancy thing, just uh, wanted to first thank uh, Harshpai uh, for such a lovely platform we get. But if in this platform, in Ascent, mm -hmm. if we can get somebody from our industry, like if I say a retail industry, and if somebody can just talk about it for an hour or something, you know, and just tell them our, tell us their challenges and their, how they've come up and how, what steps they've taken, maybe sometimes, you know, that one thing can just trigger us and we can also move forward that way. So if we can get some this consultancy thing, one hour at least from the retail expert or somebody, you know. Even a and session this, like this, uh, yeah. a session or consultancy? A different. session, <coughs> a session. So of course for... Think depending on what number of people may be there in detail, you may just want to look at all your asset members and wherever there are. We've had some sessions on family managed companies. You know? Yeah, that's what So, it But now you're talking of a certain retail certain industry. Category yeah. Or yeah. Some yeah. Some yeah. 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 And there are a sufficient number of people we can get it. Getting people is not an issue. Yeah. yeah. But we need so to just ensure that there are enough number of interested so that's just a suggestion. You can try out so many. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The conclave will cover it. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, I'm Akhilesh. Um, 
I run a manufacturing company into packaging. Uh, what I wanted to understand is that when your senior team is looking to uh, who are who are not invested in your company in terms of money, but in terms of more than ten years of experience, and who are being asking you that how could you know what is in for long term, like how can we get a sh share or a pie of the profits the company is making, uh, and the background I come from is that you know I've invested in all the money. Uh, I'm giving what I'm. I should be giving. Now I'm open, and I would like to do something, but I don't know how to go about it. So I just wanted to, you know, probably get some insights on this from whoever. Are you talking like a ESOP kind of approach? You what I said? I don't know. I'm something like that. Some kind of approach. I'm just uh, open. I think wealth creation. Wealth creation. Wealth creation. I can speak also. Please do. You are better, huh? So there are many ways. There's, so I think the big what we were talking about here is what is really that they are looking for. Yeah. Um, they're not necessarily looking for a share in the company. It's not like ownership that they're looking no, for. They're really they're looking, looking for some wealth creation. Yes. They believe you're getting all the wealth creation or the value that is getting created in the company. So if it's really just sharing in that, there are many ways you can do it. The ESOP is talked about, but ESOP also comes with uh, more complexity. Also, it means that they are shareholders for a long time. So do you necessarily want other shareholders in the business? That's a question. If you want more shareholders in the business, by all means. And then they're really riding the upside and downside everything together. Shareholders get both. On the other hand, if their mindset is more of an employee and you want to keep it that way, then you have profit sharing mechanisms, um, which then you can share. You can have a very transparent system of sharing profit with some of your senior most employees. You can do phantom stock. Or uh, again, a mechanism which kind of mirrors the the value of the enterprise versus just the value of the profit. There are many ways to cut it. If you want other shareholders participating with you, then this is an option. But who would be the? I'm sure there's some service provider, somebody who helps you in, come, in arriving at the option. Then oh, actually, a, many, many. a lot of the CA firms will yeah. do it with you. Uh, okay. I'll stop. Structuring that firms, law firms, law firms, CA firms, comp firms do it, but they're all the so HR firms, but they have to be a comp and they're expert to do it. And they so law firm or CA firm? Not law. I don't think law. Yeah, that's law. They can help you structure it in that sense. But for the but for the structure, the concept, who can, uh, what is the kind of option? Then you need a good HR from first to arrive at what is the option? It's not difficult. It's not difficult. It's actually either of these. Avenue is okay. okay. So, we'll have to go into each option and then evaluate what looks best for you. And a similarly open dialogue with your colleagues who are asking for this as to what is it that they're doing. Correct. Now it's it's the wealth creation part. Yeah. No, but it's very, very real because you know they've seen somebody else who's working in a public company. Getting huge amount of money. Yes, absolutely. So don't get upset by the fact. I know. I'm open, sure. but I don't know what to do next. So I'm <laughs> just like. <laughs> no, it's not very difficult to tackle. You know. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take you. Then I'll take you next. I'll take you next, please. Hi, I'm Furkan Ali. We are into a fashion business uh, retail uh, format. Uh, we have a brand in uh, footwear space, specific into women fashion. And uh, the question is. Uh, Sometimes there is a big challenge which comes in front of us as a growing brand. Uh, what would be and how should we determine the velocity of scale in terms of at times external factor like uh, there would be a lot of pressure to raise money since it is a cost intensive business we need to keep funding the business. Uh, so whether you can bridge it with a you know debt or rather raise the capital. So while you raise the capital the question comes you know the velocity of scale has to be at a certain level, otherwise the interest of an investor doesn't uh, come to that level. But at the same time, other external factors like, you know, uh, you need to see the unit metrics of the whole business and see the whole sense of the business in terms of it is right to scale it at this time or not. So what is it, what is the right balance of this scale? <coughs> if we are growing too fast, if we are growing too slow, where do we, you know, always determine this factor because this is challenging. It always comes in front of you as a challenge. So, like in, in, in just in a very very a very loaded question. Very loaded, uh, question. Uh, just, just to go into details is very difficult. No, to ask the question. Yeah. 
you need to know a lot more yeah, about yeah, the business. Yeah, you cannot do it in two five answer. minutes. You need to see what is the margin, what is implications of the going, what are the risks, mm -hmm. what kind of money. So it's something which cannot be addressed in two or five minutes. It, and it's, I'm not, I'm saying no because it's suicidal for us to also do a choice <laughs> without knowing the, exactly what is the issue. So, are you a manufacturer, are you a brand, are you a supplier? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many ways you can do right. footwear. Right. Uh, and it's a very competitive, very, again, very unorganized sector. Very few brands. So, right. big space. Right. We're in a great industry. Um, but we'd have many, many more questions before we can give them. Okay, great. Okay. Are you a lady in the back? Hi. 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 Um, my name is Dipti, and I'm in the culture and communication space. I was curious to know your journey, Anjali's, uh, Bansal's journey, and maybe two or three minutes around that. And my question is, how do you handle... Uh, <coughs> hmm. So, to the second one, I will say I don't know, because I haven't had to do it. And I but in your team, in your organization, have you not experienced... Uh, getting fatigued, yes. Okay, but not burnout. When you're saying burnout, is a... <laughs> How big is the Fortunately, explosion? I haven't. Maybe fortunately, I've got loads of people, of course, who get to a point where they have just burnt the. Yeah, so, just to clear the question here, as entrepreneurs, sometimes we experience burnout. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm using a very heavy word here, but there is exhaustion. There is sometimes, you know, am I really doing this for what cause? You know, those kind of questions hit me. I'm sure Harshbhai must have experienced that time and again. Why am I experiencing it? How are you managing your life and how are you? How are you? I don't know. What is your leadership style? How much are you delegating? How much are you empowering? How are you managing stress? How do you how do you meet that stress? You know, and there are different answers for meeting. You know, I, for me it's physical exercise. For you, maybe music. For somebody else, it may be reading. Else, yeah. Somebody else may be walking. So you know, it's uh, it's a combination of managing your business in terms of achieving the right work-life balance. But in spite of that, you will have stress. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you manage that stress? You need to identify within what a piece to to manage stress. But it's it's manageable. I, it's I personally think it's manageable. <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind of business. Uh, yeah. I've had very little sleepless nights in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think the only sleepless nights I've had are when I've had to deal with difficult people issues. And if I had to ask someone to leave this, and I hope I never have, I never stop having sleepless nights around that. As a leader, I would want to give, I, want, I would want a difficult decision around letting someone go, I would want that to give me stress. But that's me. So, um, otherwise sleepless night, if I, I don't necessarily think so, but uh, I think in work-life balance is a very good point. Uh, for most entrepreneurs, work is enjoyable. So you don't need balance. Actually. So you, you work, you live. I meant it for professionals. I meant it for professionals. So for entrepreneurs, I just gave an example. I meant it for professionals who are for your personality A type, you know, how to manage them and get get the extract the best out of them. And suddenly they feel overworked, they feel stressed and you know. So that's part of leadership and management. You have folks who go through those places where they're saying, oh my god, this is too much, I can't handle it. And then you, uh, it's uh, part of being a leader is also being a bit of an air traffic controller, both for yourself and for your team. Because you know there are all these planes, they have to land, you can't let anyone go, so you just do it one at a time and you help your colleagues see it the same way and do it. And sometimes you have to do a bit of triage. When you have a team where you know your system capacity is X, but the work that is coming because of very happy circumstances of growth, so it's a high quality problem to have, and you have more work than you or your team can handle, it's a good problem to have versus the other way, when you don't have enough work. Right? So if that's the case, then you have to do a bit of triage. And uh, give, I think taking holidays helps for everybody. So insisting, and it doesn't have to be big, long, fancy holidays. Just taking a couple of days of, and it's different things for different people. So for someone, it could be exercise or sailing or golf or whatever, and for others, it could be reading and music. Um, or shopping, I don't know what it is for you. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> I, was just I remember Harshbhai's golf, the first meeting that we had, and I was like amazed, how does he do it? At 4 p.m., 5 p.m., he just walks out. <laughs> no, and so because our own coping mechanisms are not a nice to have. 
it's a must have. Must have. If you don't do that, you won't be effective. So you shouldn't think about it as leisure. It's actually a requirement. Thanks, that's a good one. And the first question. Okay, but I think we can chat about that. Please. Yeah, so, uh, to the back? Okay, sorry, I just started. Okay, you go ahead. Next one. So, how long do you leave? Uh, so I'm doing my second startup now. So uh, question is, uh, how long do you leave monetization? How far in the future? If you have good adoption, then how long do you leave monetization? Do you really want to think about monetization in the beginning? If you're trying to. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you should know that you will be able to monetize. Uh, so the question th that's because I knew that something like that somebody will give a reply to that. But the deeper question is this: If you are doing something that is fundamentally going to alter the way people transact in things, or if the product value is such that it is it's not existing, so you cannot have anything comparable. For example, to give you an example of uh, most fundamental things, like for example, take a Google or a Facebook, can't happen in five years. You cannot think of monetization in the beginning. You don't know how to monetize. You don't really know because you're unlocking the value of that thing, but you know that it is fundamentally something important because people are adopting it, people are engaging with it. And uh, so how, how long do you leave it? And uh, do you start thinking about it in the beginning? Then I'll give you an example. So we are actually trying to alter the talent business this time. Okay, the way, I mean, and I hear a lot of talk about talent. So we identified a fundamental problem with the way talent is dealt with in the world. And we tried to find a solution. Now, when we built a solution, our approach was different. And we went in the market. And the first time that we were talking to businesses, and they, to a business chamber, and they came out with a small supplementary thing that they wanted in the product. Now, if you were thinking about monetization from the beginning, we would not sit and suddenly now alter our prototype to fit this in, but it was a great solution. And today, that's what is driving our adoption. It's a very small tweak, very small little thing. It, we don't know, should we monetize it? Lots of people are telling us, why don't you start charging for it? And sometimes we feel that that's ridiculous. You can't charge for this. This is too small a thing. And it might, then if you start monetizing it, then we will really, will we actually go down the path that we were thinking will go down? Because this might be easy money then. This will just become like an app. That's not fundamentally going to change the talent industry at all. It's not going to change it, human resources. It's, it's only going to be a tool. It's a small little tool that you just sell on the app stores. But there's this big danger in becoming that, right? So, do you go after those big goals and how long can you go after them? 18 months, 36 months, how long should you go? deep belief that this will fundamentally change how something is done right. and it will require a long lead time, then uh, by all means continue down the non-monetization path till you have critical mass. Right. Um, and if it's a Google or a Facebook or whatever, you know you're... But they didn't know that, right? When they were doing Google, they didn't really know that. So, which is why it is not possible to actually respond to your question and say, when should you monetize? No. There is no right answer. I, I do hope that you have enough financial resources. No, but nobody has enough financial resources. So, so then you have <laughs> They're to always round to round, right? You just go. Which is, which is, I think, one of the questions you have to uh, weave into this issue. So, so the question is about that. But when people do invest into the business, then again, then what is the answer that they are seeking? And what kind of people exist who fund the long term? The DC industry exists to do that. They, um, and so you, you need to find the right kind of investors who, first of all, understand your space and your technology, believe in it. Well, it's also a good way for you to test your model because they see a lot of highly disruptive technologies and uh, then get the right investors who will have enough staying power along with you. But eventually, I think the world is moving, particularly in India, towards a show me the money. So where is the monetization? And when you come to series B, series C, it is very, very important to be able to show where will you actually get revenue. No, where, where is one thing, but to actually start taking that money in, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's so two I I don't think you can answer your question as to when without knowing a whole lot more. And even then, I don't know if I can. So, what is the general standard? There is no general standard. Look at Google to your point. I know. So, my I answer to that is depending on the type of sector or the industry yeah. you are in. You have to see. Uh, Zoom resources. 
Sorry. It's human resources. Whatever it is, you are. And I come from media, so I, I would have answered that question very easily about media. Yeah, but in <coughs> FMCG, uh, if you ask me what is our payback uh, for a new business, I'm waiting, willing to wait for two, 10 years to break even and start making money. Because in FMCG, first few years, it's just investing in the brand, creating a advertising budget will be higher than the turnover. You know, True, but years. you'll also be, uh, you start selling very quickly. You will not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so your selling are. is not really postponed. In here, we are not trying to sell anything to anyone for a long time. So right. just getting revenue. Just They're not getting revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Not profit. It's not profit. profit. Ah, but you're generating trials. You're generating trials. They're giving trials. away the product, right? Yeah. Yeah. That I don't know about, but that may be generating trials. I don't know what it does. But yeah, I it's, think it depends it's on it's the It's adoption. So it's, uh, unless a lot of people adopt it, you can't fundamentally change the market. I think so for a good business proposition, there is no lack of resources in the market. It's not easy to find though. Like you said, it's drying up, right? Because people don't want to take a long view anymore. They do want to take a long view. They just want to know that at some point there is monetization. And that monetization, there is enough of a market for not just for adoption, but for actually monetized adoption. So will you have revenue? And then once it goes behind a paywall, right. for media, once it goes behind a paywall, will you sustain growth? No, I mean, media is a different question. But this is HR. This is a different thing altogether. Yeah, different beast. Are not very different. Okay. But a fund size a fund is in five to seven years, right? <coughs> They're typically a fund is. If, if they, are, they are coming in and my uh, revenues are going to start coming in 36 months, uh, how does it work for them? That's actually, that's not a problem. Okay. So, uh, remember the fourth pillar I spoke about financing? So along with business strategy, you also think about your financing strategy which is you may have a fund or two funds who are very early, maybe they're seed stage investors, they see you through your first 48 to 60 months, your first five years, at which point they need to exit. But if you're building a good business, you may not have profit, but you've created enterprise value, at which point they should be able to do a secondary sale. Okay. So you'll have a later, I'm not saying later stage private equity, but you'll have a series A fund come in somewhere along the way. So between now and so 60 months, so 30 maybe at 36 months, you will have a Series A investment company. So 36 to 48, before you start mm -hmm. making any revenue at all, is actually not stroke too out of the world. I don't know. It depends on your business. Right. So we'll have to get into a whole lot more detail. But you have to think about financing also, which is sequenced along and in phase with your business. I mean, right now, we're only doing it safes, right? So we're only using safes. I think we need to cut this because others are being, uh, yeah, sorry, sure. kind of a one-way conversation, apologize. Uh, Mary, so you can have it on the side. Sure. Yeah. I think there's a lady at the back had a question, and then yeah. I'll be. Yeah. yeah, my name is Chankana, and uh, I run the contact center for the last 10 years. And uh, we are sort of self-funded, uh, as in our customers fund us through the, ca we manage through our own cash flows. So um, what I realized is that throughout my professional career, we were always looking at customer delight and customer first. I'm going back to the four pillars you spoke about, customer first and then people and all of that. But slowly I find myself leaning more towards people first and customer second because I find that customer delight more often than not equates to exploitation of the partner or the <laughs> vendor <laughs> and it dents your cash flows, it dents, I mean, it dents your profitability, especially in low margin businesses like ours. So um, is it somewhere, I mean, am I being fundamentally going wrong somewhere or? Mm. Because I tend to go back <laughs> Not to at clients. Not doing absolutely the right thing yeah. because there can be badly behaved clients so then have to be. Yeah, especially in the local, I mean, domestic market, we yes, find it's very different when you <laughs> deal with international markets and domestic so we just get very aggressive with our clients sometimes oh, okay good okay. <laughs> 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 so you're giving them something that they should value yeah absolutely and you should arrive yeah. at a, a point of view and an um, agreement yeah. on what that value is and you should be absolutely. quite aggressive about it That's okay all right because then i find myself being more protective about my people and their balance and not ensuring they are not getting exploited because in our business, we don't have as much control over our what our people are doing. The client has a greater control. And therefore, we always have to intervene and say, stop here and yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it helps to lay out, to 
sort of paint the landscape for your client. But if okay. they push and squeeze too much, yeah. what will happen? The, yeah. the best people in your team may not want to work for them. They will have yeah, yeah. quality. They will yeah, so we move out the best yeah, people so to the next the clients. Then. These are the implications of yeah. your Right, all right, that's fine. But you'll get because books on customer first, you'll get book on people first. Yeah, first both. I know, yeah. so oh. it's quite confusing. Because when I thought, you know, no, we were doing the right thing. The hierarchy is around what should come first. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to a specific um, trade off on things, but not on commercials, for God's sake. Okay. <laughs> if you don't value your business, they won't value you. <laughs> sure. So, because when you said that, I thought, you know, no, we're probably no, doing no. something wrong. No, okay, good. Thanks. And you spoke about um, like one of the legs being important is the processes and the system in place. So is this about uh, building SOPs and uh, processes and who drives it? The HR drives building the SOPs and getting the different uh, HODs and departments to make SOPs? Or the CEO drives it? Uh, CEO has to drive it to start with. But who documents it? And, uh, the, the functions document themselves. So your finance and accounts process should be owned by your CFO or <coughs> director of finance or whatever you call that person. But your head of finance is responsible for finance processes, the documentation, the SOPs, etc. Same thing for HR, same thing for IT, um, and any other process. It could be a customer service process, it could be a sales process. So whoever so is the leader of that function yeah. is responsible. But uh, you, as a CEO, as a founder, you have to champion it. Because it will take time and extra effort to do. The first time you do it is always harder. You have to champion it. Someone has to maintain uh, the data or the library of the formats, the master formats. And so who is the right person to? It depends. It could be whoever, maybe your CFO is the right person, maybe your HR head is the right person. Someone who has adequate seniority in the team mm -hmm. to um, have a bit more authority in doing that and then <coughs> maintaining the template and updating it and so on is a international. Yeah. My name is Samin and uh, we run a company which is uh, building a lot of technology but in product space. Uh, so we have uh, an organization that has been over time built as a very non-hierarchical organization. We don't have uh, too many power centers and everyone who is growing at the top levels is encouraged to give up their uh, direct responsibility. Now in this kind of scenario there, are, there is a team at the top which is able to uh, gel with each other, expand that team, work as a committee, jointly almost take, you know, bring together proposals and decisions which I then only have to accept. But in that kind of scenario, in the long term I look, as to who's going to be the CEO of this enterprise, I find it difficult to envision when things are working as committees, subcommittees, a lot of people going one level, two level, and they're growing people, and suddenly I have to tell one of them that, look, you guys are not equal. Now, how do I deal with this going forward? Yeah, I think what you're saying is you have distributed leadership, yeah. model, which is good actually if the leadership is capable. It's a very good model, I would think. So, and uh, I think if you have to promote one of the guys, I reckon that you continue participating or continue with that same distributed leadership model if he's coming. So, I don't see that uh, he will change dramatically. I'm presuming that the distributed leadership yeah, model is working well. It will lead to empowerment, it will lead to That's right. retention of talent, it will lead to far That's more right. hiring of diversity. So yes. I think on the face of it, looks, it looks very good and I think if you promote one guy who is, but is there committed a model, to this is, model. Is there a model that says you don't promote anybody and no, no, no. And on can the contrary, continue? On the contrary, you have to promote from within only. The moment you get somebody from outside, he will come from a different model. But what I'm saying is if you don't put somebody at the top, because internally designations don't matter. It's only when you put it out to the outside world that designation matters. So what is your driving factor right now? Is there a specific situation that requires you to have to no, promote I am just thinking that, okay, it's going on. But what will be the future when I have to give up this right? as my position? <laughs> just yeah. talking of a hypothetical I'm situation. So, but aren't you the founder anyway? No, no, no. But that's what creates a model. That's what creates a model. how far out it is. If you yeah. think it's going to happen in the next two years, then you plan for it. If it's going to happen at some point in the 
Uh, and you then have let it, it unfold. Yeah, you don't need to create some methodology now to see where it will go. Okay. And you can have a different uh, designation, you can have a different role for him as compared to a CEO and your yeah. mentor. Okay. Okay. And it's terrific that it seems to be. Yeah, I think it's very good. It's very unusual and it's, yeah. it's really good. There, what, there, different people can have different roles as their main function. So I can say chief of technology, chief of business, chief of, you know, human connect and then they can work together. Yeah. So it's not because conventionally people say you need one person at the top. Since I don't see how that can happen with our philosophy, then I don't know what to do about it. You know? But you yeah. are sort of the de facto person. That's right. So wherever there's a tiebreaker or a veto, who's that? See, right? Yeah, I mean, more or less I, I'm not needed because the philosophy is working. So they're able to bring consensus knowing what the philosophy is. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Anybody else? Please. So, um, uh, my name is Kinjal and uh, we are into manufacturing space. Uh, we do all kinds of uh, shelving systems, steel fabrication, archiving, record room. The question was, uh, from an SME point, uh, you know, we have our business plan, our strategy in place. Uh, could you briefly touch upon uh, in a very macro way, what are the ways or what are our options for fundraising? I mean, we know private equity is one possible option that we can go through, but uh, maybe a couple of other options. Let me see. We had a session on fundraising. It must be there on your portal. I yes, it's on our YouTube. I channel. think that goes into great detail. It was like a huddle session for two, three hours. Okay. Yeah, 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 very broad brush. Just, uh, uh, just a broad brush. You know, obviously, I'll try to take that up separately. <laughs> I don't think this is a topic for uh, this session, not so I think we should not. Talk but about you can think it. about yeah. uh, venture. You can think about depending on how big your business is, whether it's venture capital or it's growth in uh, growth equity. You can think about bank financing. You also now actually have a bunch of venture debt <laughs> platforms. Okay. There are many ways you can do it. We'll, uh, I'll definitely take that up. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions, then we can. All right. Thank you. 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 And of course, many, many thanks to Nikan, who's been an SN member for five years. Let me clarify that for you. You've been here for five years. Um, doesn't seem that long. I'm hoping. Enjoying it. Yeah, and I'm glad that uh, more and more when we're looking at these huddles, we're looking at um, uh, moderators from within the ecosystem because they understand this much better and can curate this and put this together much better. The second so, time you're a moderator, thank you. Yes, no, yes. So I think that's something that we want to take forward because not only are they moderating, but they're contributing as well to the conversation, and that's turning out to be a great, uh, you know, insights coming out for us. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, token of appreciation for you. Do enjoy the product. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I can't thank. Uh, Ever for so much contribution in terms of uh, time and insights that uh, keeps coming out for uh, different sessions. So uh, thank you so much. Um, having said that, since I have you guys here, there are uh, we have the next big event coming up for Ascent, which is the Ascent Conclave. If you have you have been part of that uh, last year, um, this year again uh, we are we have got this great lineup of uh, speakers coming in. Before I before I do that, for people who have missed out on the conclave last year, we just want to quickly show a recap of the conclave and then I will look forward to uh, okay. and then I will invite uh, Harsh to you know, just talk a little bit about the conclave uh, uh, this year. Uh, so I think around uh, 20 people have not enrolled out here. So I would expect that uh, all the SN members enroll and not only each of you enroll but also get one or two of your others. So the whole objective of Conclave is actually to put SN at a little bit higher pedestal in, in the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem. We want more and more people to know about SN and if 
if they attend this, then we use this as an opportunity to add more more members to our group uh, of present uh, members. So I personally urge each of you to attend the conference, yes. and not only you but also get some of your colleagues. It could be some of your employees. It could be uh, any of other entrepreneurs. And I can assure you that the program we are putting forward, and we already have most of the program. Yeah, we have all the But uh, uh, you will find it very interesting, and uh, it, uh, you meet a lot of people also as centers as well as non as centers. And it's a and what we are trying to do is we are just trying to recover the cost of SD, not, uh, so we yeah. incur some cost and that's what is being charged for. Yes. For this. So that's 7,000 for members and yeah. uh, before you leave there are boys who can help you to register right now. Oh my God. Get your credit cards out. <laughs> <laughs> do get your credit cards out, do that. Uh, and uh, we have a great panel of speakers like you mentioned. Yes. Prasun Joshi, Piyush Pandey, Bodhi, uh, brand gurus of uh, the country who are coming in different sessions and we are curating it in such a way that you get maximum insights from both <coughs> separately. We have Sajjan Jindal as our keynote speaker, last time we had Mr. Uday Kotak uh, and uh, we have Amira Shah coming in and uh, Kua Sajde from Sukam. So a lot of people that you can look forward to in terms of insights. And thank you so much. Okay, thank you so thank much you. for your thank day. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.